Good morning, Cedarbrook. My name is Ashley Chin, and we are so glad that you've joined us this morning. To those of you watching online, we are glad that you're here too. Hey, we would love it if you all would fill out a connection card. I know we talk often about connection cards, but they really do help us to get better connected with you. I will have a few more announcements a little bit later after worship. We have a great morning planned. We've got worship. We also will continue our series that Pastor Jonathan is giving called We Are Family. Before we start worshiping, I would love to read this passage. It's Psalm 9, 1 to 2. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let's stand together and worship together.
Amen. Oh Lord, may our hearts truly, truly sing no other name because we know your name is the name above all names and that you are on your throne and that you reign now and forever. Help us to live in light of this truth this morning and throughout this day. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Amen. Hello again, Cedarbrook. I just have a couple announcements for you today. We have coming up the night of prayer. We would love for you and your family to join us for this special night in the refuge. There will also be dinner for you and your family on Sunday, April 30th at 6 p.m. We'll have pizza together and then head over to the sanctuary for a devoted time of prayer. We will pray for our surrounding community and our church. Childcare is provided for eight and under. You don't need to register, just show up. We also have the Compassion Journey. Experience an interactive tour of life in the developing world by joining us for the Compassion Journey. Coming to Clarksburg the weekend of May 19th to 21st in the refuge here at Cedarbrook. This family-friendly event provides visitors an opportunity to learn about the realities faced by children growing up in extreme poverty. Through a series of audio-led exhibits, you will walk in their shoes and see the challenges and choices that are a part of their daily lives. This sounds like a really cool experience you don't want to miss. We also have the Clarksburg Closet Drive. Just next door to our church is the Clarksburg Closet. It's doing amazing outreach in our community by providing free clothing and other resources to families who need it. Diapers are a really big need to families with young children, and the closet is always in need of new underwear and socks. Come drop off diapers of any size, wipes, new packaged underwear, or socks of any size or gender starting on Mother's Day, Sunday, May 14th, through Father's Day, Sunday, June 18th at the church. As always, we greatly appreciate your generosity to, to us here at Cedarbrook and our surrounding community. If you would like to, giving online is super easy and secure. You can also use the U.S. mail as well, and there are offering boxes in the back. I am going to turn it back over to Pastor Jonathan, who's going to continue our series, We Are Family. Hey, welcome to Cedarbrook. My name is Jonathan. Am I on? Yeah? You can all hear me? Oh, there we go. All right, there we go. Um, hey, tonight, let me give you a reason to come to prayer night this evening. Uh, Mike Tyson, the the prophet of our day had once said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth all right and if you feel like you've been punched in the mouth because you are living in a disorienting and confusing time then tonight make time for your heavenly father make time for your brothers and sisters and pray pray with one another pray with us because we want to pray um, not only for us but relationships that we have with God with each other and with the world around us. 6 p.m., I'm told that there is pizza, right, for dinner. So if you don't have dinner plans, that's what your dinner plans are. <laughs> Eat pizza and pray, okay? Um, speaking of prayer, this Thursday, May 4th, is the National Day of Prayer. For those of you who are looking for a spot to pray in the middle of the week, our church building will be open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. that day. Stop by if you want prayer, if you need to pray um, somewhere quiet that's away from the business of your day. We're here, we're open for the National Day of Prayer. But that goes for every single day of the week. The church is open during the week, too, just so everyone knows, right? We're, we're open, you know, Tuesday to Friday for people to walk in. You don't always have to show up here on Sundays, okay? Um, pray with us. That would be wonderful. National Day of Prayer, 7 a.m., 9 p.m. that day. A pastor will be here all day, okay? Uh, let's pray. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together. Lord, you, you help us celebrate the goodness of, your li of our lives, God, through what you do. And, and I, I don't know what each of our weeks have looked like. I, I don't know what this coming week has in store, but I do know that your goodness will overwhelm us and it's gonna flow through each of us. 
And Lord, I know it's by your spirit that we're connected to you. God, even these words that I'm praying over right now, it comes because your spirit empowers us to speak it. God, you you understand us in our groaning. You understand us in our tiredness, in our weakness. And God, we, we just want to lift ourselves to you by your spirit. Let your spirit rest upon us. Let your power be manifested in our lives to testify to this disorienting, this confused world that you are awesome, that you are alive, and that you do wonderful works. Lord, if there are any here whose hearts and minds have been closed because of scars or because of hurts that they've suffered, Lord, I ask that you would see them, that you would hear them, and that you will heal them. Lord, they are home. Help us have a heart like your own. Grant us clarity, encourage us, empower us to live out a culture that you bestow on us as your beloved children. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And at the sound of the multitude, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Amalites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Creatines and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mockingly said, they are filled with new wine. That's the word of the Lord. Over the last few weeks, we we were looking and trying to paint the picture of what the family of God has a culture of. And so, as a family of God, we said over the last two weeks, we embody a culture of hope. We embody a culture of unity. And when we saw that, when we start embodying these attributes of the culture that God gives us, what happens is undeniable in our own lives, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities, in our schools. Today, I want to explore something more tangible than an idea of hope and unity. Today, I want to explore the nature and culture of our gatherings, of our parties, of our getting together, of our events. You you see, when when we read the Bible, what we come to understand is that Jesus loved getting together with people. His first miracle was at a wedding with family. His mother was there. He created water into wine. His disciples were accused of partying too much. That's what the Pharisees said. They said, hey, we are, you know, fasting and we're, we're sacrificing, but your disciples, they go on partying. And Jesus said, why wouldn't they? I'm here, right? So partying or getting together is something that our family is told to do, getting together, gathering together. So I want to ask all of us, what do your parties, what do your get-togethers look like? Would you say that your get-togethers or your gatherings with family, are, are they wild? Are they crazy? Is it chill? Is it laid back? Some of you are laughing. You're like, no, none of that. My gatherings are actually hectic and boring, if not contentious, right? I, I, I mean, tap your neighbor. Tap the neighbor that you didn't come with and ask, what is your gathering like? No, no, seriously, go. Tap your neighbor. We, we haven't done this, right? <laughs> Try to describe your next party to them. All 
All right. It, it sounds like a lot of fun gatherings. Make sure you get your neighbor's number and invite yourself to their party. All right. Um, you know, let, let's be honest, right? Hearing the description of the get together that your neighbor has, would you go? I don't hear a lot of yeses. I, I'm a little worried now. <laughs> Real worried about where I'm going to go next, all right? Um, let, let, let me flip the question. Let me flip the question, and you don't have to discuss this. Just think about it in your brain because I don't want to feel bad. How would you describe our church getting together? Would you describe it as something you'd want to go to? Or would you say, it's a little too hectic for me? It's a little too awkward. It's too traditional or, or maybe too loud for your taste. Maybe you don't feel like it's welcoming enough. Anybody? How many people have any feelings about this at all? <laughs> all right, okay. My, my goal today, my goal today then, right, is to show you that our spiritual family's culture of getting together or gathering will testify and does testify to the power of God. That's what it's designed to do. That's what our gatherings are meant to do, to testify to the power of God. So here's the first thing I, I need all of us to understand about our family's gatherings. God's family meets together, period. God's family meets together, period. And you, you see, meeting together, gathering together is not an option. It's not an opinion that we have. It's not how we feel on that day. It's what we do. Gathering together is something that the family of God does, period, right? And, and, and so what, what we understand by this and what we see is that families that get together as opposed to families that don't get together stand united. They stand hopeful. They stand supported by one another. And, and families who don't get together, we see, they, they feel more isolated. They're more fractured. They're more lonely. L let's go to verse one. We're, we're gonna see this here in Acts chapter two. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place. You see, Pentecost wasn't a random Sunday. Pentecost was actually a holiday. It was a holiday on the Jewish calendar. The word Pentecost comes from the Greek word pente, right? Which means 50th. And it marks the 50th day after the Passover. That's what it originally meant, right? So what they did was they took the Passover and they said, well, it's seven weeks of weeks. And so they had seven weeks of seven weeks. And so that was 49 days, seven times seven. And then they waited a day and they had this big celebration called Pentecost. And so what it actually commemorated, it was a Jewish feast of weeks. And it commemorated the day that Israel as a nation coming out of Egypt received from God the law. And said, we are committing ourselves as a nation under God. Committing ourselves to our God who liberated us from slavery. That, that's what it originally, that's where it came to, that's what they celebrated. And, and so this was a big deal. This was a national holiday. And so on the day of Pentecost, when it arrived, you see that Luke says they were all gathered at one place. Uh, we, we said there were about 120 people in that upper room when Jesus told the disciples, hey, go back to Jerusalem and wait. And so now this holiday came seven weeks from that day, and now they're here celebrating, gathered together. They didn't all split after seven weeks, they got together, right? And, and so w when the family of God, they got together, what they're doing here is celebrating their commitment to God because there's no other reason for them to be where they are. None of them were there. And, and when they celebrate, they, they celebrate it through singing and then praying and listening and eating and fellowshipping with their brothers and sisters. That's what they did. That's what they did. And, and they also believed that God would be there with them. You see, in real life, here in our calendar, Pentecost might still be a month away, but the practice of meeting together like it's Pentecost is here for us now. That's what we do on Sundays. We gather together to celebrate our commitment to our God who liberates us from our sins, who liberates us from our addictions, who liberates us from the tiredness of this world. That's why we have to prioritize getting together and meeting with the family of God because we have the opportunity to celebrate like it's a holiday 
And so we need to prioritize gathering together with our spiritual family. Because if we're not, we're missing out on an incredible opportunity. You, you see, but, but this meeting together, this gathering, it goes much further than just our Sundays, doesn't it? For, for some of us, it means that when we gather, we gather in smaller groups, right? We call them growth groups, we call them DNA groups here, right? We call them Bible studies, we call them men's events, Iron Men, right? Women's events, they just did one on, on Friday night. But we commit ourselves to meeting so that we can say we're celebrating our commitment to God, that, that's why we do those things. That's why we do these things, to celebrate that commitment because that commitment requires celebration. It requires us to say, you know what? I'm gonna intentionally set apart this time to connect with my family, to see what God does because God did an amazing thing in my life and we can't wait to see what he does now from here. And, and so th this is a tall order to say, hey, we need to gather together. I know some of us are not even ready to commit to that. We're not even ready to commit to coming each week on a Sunday. But I want to make this clear. This is what the family of God does. This is the culture that we're called to embody, to prioritize meeting with family. Not saying, hey, there's an O's game or there's a Nats game. Neither of them are going to make the playoffs. Not important, <laughs> right? Gather together with your family, Right? gather together with your family. And, and I, I, I know what, what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, that sounds great in principle, except tree hugger Ben right there and, and racist Sally over here. I can't stand talking to them, let alone sitting next to them, right? And, and so, you know, what, what you're really afraid of is neither the tree hugger or, or the racist. What you're really afraid of is Pentecostal Pete inviting you to the next prayer meeting, 6 p.m. tonight, by the way, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's what it is, right? And so, you know, we, we, we do these things and we have these excuses, but we have to realize that tree hugger and that racist, that was us. The people that we can't stand to be around in church, that was us in front of God, right? Because when, when we think about before God pursued us and before we accepted Jesus as our Savior, we were that person that God couldn't stand to be around, we had a stench. It smelled like death, and it came from our sin. And so we, we had that. We embodied that. Yet that didn't stop God from pursuing us, from giving up his one and only son to save us. And so it's through that grace and mercy that we have this beautiful, beautiful connection to this family, this adoption into a family of eternity and so we gather together here in the present to say, God, we are committed to you because you committed to us first. We are his beloved children who meet together to celebrate God's commitment, not only to us back then when we were sinners, but now in the present and in the future. You, you see, not only is God's family characterized by meeting together, God's family's gatherings is marked by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Come down to verse 2 with me. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when our family meets together, the Holy Spirit comes from heaven and fills each of us with himself. You see, what Luke is depicting here is the promise that God would send the helper when Jesus ascended into heaven, right? It's the gift of the Holy Spirit for all of those who believe in him and put, his, put their trust in him. But what he's really hitting home for us in this passage is this, that when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that is God with us, present in us, never leaving us, and when we meet together, we need to expect the supernatural. We need to expect the supernatural, I mean, answer honestly, right? How many of us come to these meetings, come to church on Sunday, expecting God to do something supernatural? Anybody? I mean, honestly, if I had to ask, right, and if I had to be honest, I can't say that I always do, and I'm the pastor, right? I mean, what would happen if we came expecting God to do something supernatural amongst us? Have you thought about what would happen? What, what do you think you would see and witness 
when we see God do the supernatural every time we gather together, would that be a good reason to come? I bet it would, right? I mean, what, what happened to us that we've become so numb to the supernatural work of God in our lives? Can we answer that? Does it just feel like sometimes we're blowing smoke and the AC's too cold in here? Or, or maybe that tingling feeling in your legs is coming because your kids left you a crumb to sit on, right? Like, what, 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 do you, what do you take with these feelings and these thoughts that you're having when the supernatural's all around us? Have we written off God as simply a clockmaker watching his creation tick away? Whatever the reason, whatever the reason, I, I don't want any of us to miss what God is doing when we are gathered together because God is doing his work. Uh, look, look, at, look at what Luke says again, right? Look, highlight these phrases in your Bible, right? Suddenly, suddenly, there came from heaven. It wasn't natural. It didn't come from where we are. A sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house, right? The supernatural work of God was present in their gatherings. And Luke is saying that he really didn't have the words to describe it. So he's going to give you these analogies, what it sounded like, what it felt like, where it came from. And he answers and explains that the Holy Spirit, this supernatural power, it came suddenly when they didn't expect it. When they didn't expect it. It, it came from heaven, not, not from here, from around us, but it came from somewhere else. And we know it didn't come from us. We know it didn't come from Pastor Jonathan. We know it didn't come from Pastor John. It came from heaven, from God, right? And what the experience was, was so disorienting, right? It felt like a mighty rushing wind. That's what it sounded like. But you see, the purpose of this coming, of this supernatural act, was simple. And Luke says, it was to fill each person there. It was to fill each person there with God's spirit. How amazing is that? You see, when we gather together and we expect God to do something supernatural, Luke is saying we expect God to fill us, to do something in us when we gather together. That, that, that is a beautiful gift that we have. Let's not take that for granted, but let's cherish that. Let's make that the reason we keep on meeting together even if you dislike the person that you're sitting next to, even if you're not sure where that person's coming from. 15 months ago, uh, our daughter, Kate, um, she's our oldest, she, she experienced a seizure. And, and the seizure, it, it wasn't two minutes long or three minutes long like, like a normal seizure. It went on for 90 minutes. 90 minutes. And, and I mean, the, the, these 90 minutes were... The, the most afraid that I have been ever in my life, right? It, it was the most fearful time that Michelle and I had ever gone through or lived through as a married couple. And, and so, you know, we watched our daughter be strapped to a bed, looked over by doctors and nurses because they couldn't stop this thing. And it didn't matter what medicine that they gave her, it didn't matter what they injected her with, it, like it just kept going and it kept going and it kept going. Until the doctors, they were like, you know what? We, we just can't do anything about it. We need to tranquilize her. And they put her to sleep. And, and so helplessly, we watched as these doctors worked, and we could see Kate's eyes. Like We, we could see her. She could see us. And, and we knew that they, she could see us, and we could, we could see her, but there's nothing that we could do. There's nothing that her little body was capable of doing. There, there was a disconnect there. And, and we asked ourselves, where's God? Where is God? If this seizure is normal, if this is natural for human beings to go through it, where's God now? God is the God of the supernatural. And so we, we waited. We waited. And we waited some more, asking God, where are you? Why haven't you done anything? Because if this is normal, if this is reality, we don't want to be here. This stinks. And so in our waiting, because the doctors are like, she'll wake up soon. Soon felt like an eternity. Minute after minute and hour after hour, it just kept ticking away and she's still there. What could you do as a parent besides pace around? 
thinking about what you may have done wrong, what sins you may have committed, and to be like, God, uh, what? Why is this happening? We've done everything, everything that you've asked for. And then when the doctors come in and they say, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Kwan, we want to prepare you for a new normal. What do you mean a new normal? And so, you know, the doctors were saying, you know, best case, there'll be some paralysis. Eventually, because the brain damage, you know, she'll, she'll relearn how to live again. But we won't know. We won't know until the tests come back, until she wakes up again. Like, how, how reassuring is that? Like, it's like, you went to school, doctor. Like, why don't you know? Why don't you know? We're like, we're here. And you're supposed to know you're the doctor. And, and so there, there was anger. Not, not only in our hearts, but in our minds. And we're just harboring it. It's oozing out of us. And about 24 hours later, Kate wakes up. And just like the doctor said, she was different. She, she couldn't walk straight or get up. She tried. She couldn't talk straight. And, and she was angry. And she was angry. And, and so for a week, we were in the hospital with her, and the doctors were running all sorts of tests. And every single day, we're asking God, where, where are you? What are you doing? Why haven't you fixed this yet? We, we've been faithful. Something is wrong and something is broken and, and we know that, but God, you, you can do something, right? And, and this was our prayer. And, and we're, we're bargaining, God, do something, we'll, we'll do whatever you ask for. Whatever you ask for. And yet nothing. Silence. And eventually after the week, after a week of tests, the doctors were like, you know what? The scans are still not coming back well. There's something wrong. We just don't know what because we see something is wrong, but her body is acting like it should. We're, we're not seeing the physical manifestations of it. So you can go home now. We have nothing else we could do, so go home. How reassuring is that? And, and I remember the words that they told us, if something does happen, come back to the hospital. <laughs> right? Like, like, and so we, we go home. And isn't it funny how when you're looking for help, you just can't find any? We couldn't find a doctor to take this case until finally we did. And we found a doctor, and the doctor says, you know what, I want to meet with you, I want to meet with Kate, and I want to see the tests. And so we show the doctor, you know, the reports and all of this. It's huge, you know, binder full of stuff. And she goes, well, I've never seen anything like this. But I'm looking at Kate now, and I see these tests. And we have a choice. The choice is we could continue to figure out what happened, what's wrong, and what's, what triggers it and when it's going to happen again. Or we can say God's already dealt with it and live our life. That maybe this is the way God has wired her. And that's the supernatural reality of nature. We can try to figure it out or say, God, you've already figured it out because you've already done the impossible and you've already healed her because even though the doctors can't explain it and the doctors won't explain it, you've already delivered. And so we, we, we go and say, you know what? If that's what it is, then I choose that. We don't want to live in fear. We want to live in faith. We want the faith to say, even if it's not normal according to the world, the supernatural God, our God, our Father, rewrites what normal is. That's what he does for us. That's what our faith says. That's what our religion says. There is no other religion in the world that says you can hope and try to do all the good works that you possibly can to maybe, maybe get a chance at eternity. You see, only in our faith, only in our religion does God come down to us and say, you know what, we know you can't achieve it. You can't do it on your own, so I'm going to give you a way. I'm going to sacrifice my son. That's what we believe, that we had no way, that we had no ability, but God does it for us. He paved the way. He did it for us. And that's what we celebrate, and that's what our gatherings are indwelled by, that power. You see, when we get together as a spiritual family, 
we need to expect God to do things that are not normal, that are supernatural, that are filled with his grace and mercy, because that's exactly who our God is, who our Father is. The early church expected God to be present with them when they gathered. So we need to expect God to be present when we gather. Uh, let, let me give you some examples of what this looks like so you can be paying attention to it. You, you see, when a person here admits his or her sins and, and says, we believe in Jesus as our only Savior, and we confess Jesus, and that person confesses Jesus as Lord, God has done su something supernatural in his heart or in her heart because that's not normal. That's not normal to say, I have no control, that I have no ability, that I have to rely on somebody else, on God to free me. That's not normal. That's supernatural. You see, it's not normal for relationships to be restored and have reconciliation because you know what? They receive and are extended the grace and mercy of forgiveness from God here at a gathering that his people have. And so when we see relationships healed, when we see people reconciled, sons and daughters to parents and parents with each other, spouses to each other, we understand that because we're sitting under the scripture, the power of the Holy Spirit takes both of them, all parties involved, and reconciles them in unity. That's supernatural. That's not normal. You see, when we see the broken and the sick and the lonely, when they find healing and wholeness and acceptance, it's because the Spirit is permeating within them with all of us supernaturally changing dispositions mentally and physically because only God can do that. That's why we gather. That's what our gathering's about. And so when Luke gives us this picture of the Holy Spirit descending suddenly, and saying this is what the Holy Spirit's like when it comes to your presence, to your gatherings, we say, yes, we want that. We want to gather for that. And we expect God to be here and show us things and do things that we don't expect naturally. But I, I want to take this a little further because Luke gives us more of a picture of what the Holy Spirit's like. Not, not only do, does the Holy Spirit come suddenly and fills this place with the supernatural, it does the important work of sanctifying, of purifying. Look what it says when, when Luke talks about the Holy Spirit. The divided tongues as a fire rested on each of the gathered people. What he was describing theologically, I, I don't know if he knew this, but we know this now, that it was describing the supernatural work of sanctification, that the work of making God's family pure in the image of Christ. You, you see, when, when we accept Jesus Christ, what we understand is that we've become clean. We've become clean from our sins. But what, what we don't understand, and this is what the Holy Spirit does, is as we continue to submit ourselves to Christ, what the Holy Spirit does is it continues to conform us each day through our thinking, through our interacting through our living to be more and more in the image of his son. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It purifies, he purifies our motives, our habits, and our actions to be like our Savior. It happens at our gatherings. And that's a supernatural work within us because guess what? We all do what we can't and don't want to do. Yet God in us works in us, changing us to become more like him. The Holy Spirit upends the natural order for God's order. Don't doubt that. Don't close your eyes to it. Don't close your ears to it. Believe it and expect it in your life because that's exactly what God is doing. And when we say we are going to commit ourselves to be a willing canvas of his sanctifying work, God will work. I believe there will be supernatural in you that's happening and that will happen. Come to expect that. You see, when we expect God's spirit to sanctify the gathered, what we're going to find is that God's family is gatherings it attracts those searching for God. God's family's gatherings attract those searching for God. Let's go to verse four again. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse five, now there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Do you see what's happening here? What's happening here is when the family of God gathers and the Holy Spirit is present, the Holy Spirit 
is drawing people who are in close proximity to the family of God. And I don't care if you come from a Pentecostal background or a Baptist background or a Presbyterian background. What, what we see here is the speaking of tongues that Luke is talking about. It says that the Spirit gives them the ability to speak in other tongues as they had utterance, right? No matter how you cut it, that's supernatural. That's supernatural and it's within all of us. It's with all of us. And, and what I can't explain is the mechanics or what language that they're speaking, but what, can I, what I can explain is the purpose the purpose was simple. The purpose is so that we could share the hope and power of the gospel to those who are in close proximity with us. You see, the language that we use here at church, it, it can be confusing to some. It might even sound foreign to some. But when the Spirit gives us utterance and language and tongues, we can actually speak to people in the language that they speak, in the language of the world in the language of Halo, in the language of Grand Theft Auto, in the language that they understand. And so this is a beautiful supernatural power that we are bestowed with by the Spirit of God. And we're called and said, use it, use it. It's only you. Only you can speak to a bunch of lawyers in the room. I can't. It's only you that can talk to a bunch of finance guys or, or a bunch of salon keepers or gamers or other types of professionals it's only you that speak their language and the language of God you have that spirit you have that power and you, you need to use that and take that in faith take that in faith and use it as you have ability all of you should have gotten this piece of paper right it says around the brook everybody got that online I think you can find this on our website there should be a link in the notes below you, right? These, these are a list of our gatherings. Ashley told us what our gatherings are outside of Sundays this month. The reason we highlight these and the reason we put them in your seats is so that you can take them home. Put it on your refrigerator, put it on the, the vanity in your bathroom, wherever you spend more time, and look at these events and ask yourselves, who can I be sharing who's in close proximity about my spiritual family's gatherings? because only you can invite them. I can't invite them. I don't know who they are, but you do. They live in close proximity to you. They speak the same language as you. They're in the same place as you are. And it's real important that you do this because God has given you the supernatural ability to speak to them in a way that nobody else can. Take it home, look at it. Verse 7. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? What Luke is pointing out is, it's interesting to see that people, that people look at you one way, knowing that you're a Christ follower, but when they hear you speak in the way that they can understand, they look at you in a totally different way. You suddenly don't become weird. <laughs> right? Just saying. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Phamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. And I want to leave you with this one last thought. Our family gatherings testify to the power of God. Our family gatherings testify to the power of God. You see the list of nationalities here? They're in that order on purpose. What Luke is saying, from easternmost to westernmost in the known world... God is speaking. God speaks to all of them. And it doesn't matter which end of the earth you live in. From as far east as is to the west, God speaks. And when our family, when the family of God gathers, it will reach the ends of the earth. There is no ethnic political lines. There is no social or economic divides that will stop 
people from hearing the good news of Jesus when his family gathers together. You see, I I wanna ask, what, what do you think these people heard when they heard the mighty works of God? I have an opinion, and I think what they heard is that God so loved you, man from Egypt, woman from Rome, that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, not to condemn you for your sinfulness, not to condemn you because you don't know who I was, but to provide you a free gift, the gift of salvation. Jesus, my son, he did this by living sinless, and then he laid himself down for you for you from Cyrene. He died the death that you should have died. And because I found his sacrifice righteous and guiltless he was, I vindicated my son and resurrected him from the dead. We all witnessed that. There are people who witnessed that. We celebrate that and commit ourselves to the family of God because of that. I think that's what they heard. That's what they heard. And they heard this, and they said, wow, isn't that weird? Doesn't that ask and beg more questions? Look at it in verse 12. I I don't want to mislead you. All were amazed. This is an amazing testimony. This is not normal. They were perplexed, saying to each other, what does this mean? You see, testifying about an all-powerful and all-loving God it's going to cause more questions. That's why we have groups that meet, gatherings like Alpha at our church, to answer those types of questions, right? What does it mean? But the same testimony that caused some to question, it's going to cause others to mock. And we see that in verse 13, others said they're filled with new wine, and we're going to get into this next week. But mocking our faith and belittling it is not something new to the 21st century. It didn't happen during covid It happened 2,000 years ago, right? From the very beginning. But what I want all of us to know is that it doesn't mean that we change our testimony, that Christ, that our King, that our Savior is alive, right? That we receive God and he received us. We're welcomed here, we're loved here, and we gather together to commit ourselves to our King, to our Father, to our family, because he will sanctify us. He will change us and he will do the supernatural work that only he can do in our lives. I mean, just think about what happens when we gather. What would happen when we prioritize and committed ourselves to gathering with our spiritual family? Which one of our neighbors, our colleagues, our classmates, our family members would be drawn in to witness the supernatural power of God? How would their lives be supernaturally changed? That's the question that we have. That's the culture we want to embody. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for gathering us. We know that we were invited first to this gathering by somebody experiencing your supernatural power through your spirit. God, we are so grateful that we decided to come. And now that we're here, Lord, we have an expectation that your spirit will rest on us, that it will sanctify us, and that it will do supernatural works in us to make us more like your son. God, we we believe that just the work of testifying to an unbelieving world is supernatural, and that when we speak, we speak not our words and in languages and terms that we know, but in terms and languages and phrases that those who are far from you understand. God, I ask for that supernatural power for all of us right now, that when, if, if we're sitting here questioning and asking, how does this all make sense, that you would answer, that you would answer us straightly, that you would answer us kindly, that in your mercy, we would begin to understand that you've always loved us, that you've always been searching for us, and that in our hearts and our minds, that we have been adopted as a son and daughter of an almighty God. God, for those of us who have stopped showing up, that have stopped believing that there is the supernatural here in our gatherings, I ask that you refresh them. Help them expect you to come powerfully and wonderfully. 
Help us prioritize gathering to celebrate our commitment to you. Give us courage. Give us utterance to invite others to witness the same power, the same grace. Lord, we pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing.
all may be seated. What a wonderful way of coming to communion this morning with the words of that song uh, on our lips and in our hearts. Here uh, as a church family here at Cedarbrook, on the last Sunday of every month, uh, we come together to share the spiritual meal of communion as a way of us remembering not just the reckless love of God, but also to remember and testify to the power of God that Jonathan just spoke with us about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul writes these words. He says, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And then giving the bread uh, to his disciples, he said to them, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to write that in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said to his disciples, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as you eat, this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This morning, as we gather to share the bread and the cup of this spiritual meal, I would just invite all of us to take just a moment to prepare our hearts for what we're about to receive. And I would just encourage you, um, we're, we're gonna take just a moment to think through questions like, are there any sins right now in my life that I need to repent of and seek forgiveness? Are there any relationships in my life right now that need healing? This morning, as I sit in this room, is there any hardness of heart within me or any distraction of mine that I need to lay down before I receive the bread and the cup? And so I'm gonna just ask you to take just a minute and just talk with God um, and just ask him for what you need. Ask him to fill you with only the hope that he can provide because what this reminds us of is that Christ reigns over sin in our lives and can bring us life. So please take a moment and pray. Thank you, Father, for this spiritual meal that we are about to share. May this bread and cup remind us that we are fed by your sacrificial love. We are strengthened by your life. The calling that you have laid on our hearts to be your beloved children, we receive it wholeheartedly and without any doubts. Continue to sanctify our hearts and our minds. Fill us with your spirit so that we can understand how to fill our relationships with your love. We pray this together in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning for communion, we're going to do things a little differently than what we have been doing recently. We're going to do it the way we used to do pre-COVID. <laughs> Amen. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to have four stations where people will serve communion to you. All of the bread is gluten-free. OK? 
okay? If uh, what you will do is you will come down the aisle and there will be someone there to serve you bread, at which point you will take the bread and you can dip it into the bowl of juice and you can take it or take it back to your seat, whichever you prefer. If you would prefer the, the single pre-packaged communion uh, cups that we have been using, that will be available at the station on the Promised Land wall if you would prefer that. Um, and so the worship team is gonna lead us in worship now. And I would just encourage you when you're ready to come up to the station and share this meal as a church family.
course all my life and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am in oh I will sing of the goodness came to church this morning. On the Sundays when we share communion together as a church family, we close the service by reciting the Apostles' Creed. And I recognize that for some of us, we're not sure why we do that. The Apostles' Creed has been a document. It has been a statement, a creed that has united Christians now for 1,500 years. When we talk at Cedarbrook about majoring in the majors and minoring on the minors, we think the Apostles' Creed does a wonderful job of capturing these are the majors that we hold together with men and women who follow Jesus of all tribes and languages and dialects and ethnicities all over the globe. And so that's why we do this as a community, as a family. And so this morning, the words will be on the screen here. Let's just say these together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, those are good things to believe. Well, thank you all so much for coming and spending part of your Sunday with us. It was a beautiful day to be in church this morning. <laughs> we do not know what these next seven days holds for any of us. And so until we gather again next Sunday morning, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you. Amen.